We have a pleasure today to have a Professor James Gates. He will tell us about the effective method of components fields transparency for arbitrary superfields. Please. Thank, thank you very much, Irena. And it's my very great pleasure to uh, be here. Uh, I want to recognize the fact that a number of my students are here watching me. So they, they're trying to see if the professor will embarrass himself. Uh, my graduate students and some of the undergraduates I work with are also uh, in this Zoom session with us. So uh, I'm very happy to be here. Uh, you know, I, it's been, oh, maybe 15 years since I was in Russia. So it's been a very long time since I've been in Moscow or, or Novosibirsk or Tomsk, which are places that I used to hang out in when I was young. Uh, so let's get started with our presentation today. So let me see if I can share screen. Uh, can someone <clears throat> confirm? Can someone yes. give me? Yes, yeah. thank you. Thank you yes. Okay, so this is the title of the talk, and this talk is really designed to answer a very simple question. In a Salam Strathi superfield, in a space time of arbitrary dimensions, what component fields occur? Now, this question seems probably so simple that you would say, oh, we know the answer to that. But my claim is that until recently, there did not exist practical and efficient way to answer this question. And that's what this talk is about. So we're gonna go back and do a little bit of lightning review. Uh, I'm not sure how uh, familiar people are with the standard salon stock and superfield approach, but we'll be touching on it. So uh, this, is the, <clears throat> this is the paper uh, that was written in 1974 by Salam and Strathby. I remember I was a graduate student when I first read this paper, and I was amazed at the idea that you could extend space in, uh, uh, in ways where the extra coordinates are not even real numbers. And this is strange things called Grassmann variables. And so it caught my interest, and that's how I ended up writing the first PhD thesis at MIT when I graduated in 1977. Uh, I also had this as part of my my Bible in those days. This was a preprint that was published on the same subject by Salam Strafi. <laughs> and then finally, this, uh, uh, this copy of an uh, article that was in uh, Poetry of his physique. So today, what I'm going to ask, really think, be thinking about it, although I said arbitrary in my talk, really, I'm only going to be thinking about 11 dimensions and smaller. However, the techniques and the methods that I use are easily extendable to even higher dimensions. Um, as one changes the dimensions, uh, the, no, the size of spinners grow. So if we're in four dimensions, capital D equals four, a spinner is a, uh, is a, four, a, a four entry uh, a column, four entry in a column entity. Uh, you can easily uh, calculate the square of that, 16, if we divide that by uh, half, we find out that there are eight bosons and eight fermions in the superfield. That's exactly right. Uh, if we go to five dimensions, it turns out that a spinner actually grows into an eight, uh, eight dimensional long uh, column vector. And the square of that's 264, half of 264 is 128. And so a scalar superfield in five dimensions has 128 and 100 bosons and 128 fermions. 10 dimensions is of interest to us because that's where string theory is. Again, if you ask the size of a spinner, it's a 16 dimensional object. The square of 16 is 65,536. You divide that by two, you get 32,768 bosons and 32,768 fermions. Finally, if we're in 11 dimensions, the spinner grows yet again. Uh, this time, 32 is the appropriate number. The square of that, excuse me, I'm sorry, if we take uh, two to that power, we get 4,294,967, I'm sorry, let me try this again, 4,294,967,296. We divide that by four, and we get 2,147,483,648 is the number of bosons and permit. Now these latter numbers are so large, that to all intents and purposes, research uh, in superfields at these high dimensional levels is essentially uh, a subject that has not been addressed. 
fortunately for us, uh, from the time now, as I look back to when I was a graduate student, computers have been invented and you know, enriched. They were actually around when I was, uh, was uh, entering uh, freshman. And I remember programming in the old Fortran language with punch cards, something I'm sure young people have no idea what that means. Um, but even though superfields grow, as you can see, as two to the size of the spinner, which means very exponential growth, what we know at low levels is that the minimal representations, in fact, do not grow so large. So for example, in the case of n equal four supergravity, which is the same thing as supergravity in 10 dimensions, <laughs> the minimal uh, representation has 128 bosons and 128 fermions. The fact that these two numbers are different is in fact one of the puzzles that I'm going to at least touch on today, although I will not solve it. Here's a superfield, a typical superfield. It's an expansion. We can think of it as a Taylor series expansion, but we expand over two sorts of variables. There's one sort of variable which represents the four coordinates of space time. And then we introduce a spinorial coordinate. And that the range of this index is one to the lowercase d that I was talking about. So if uh, d is equal to uh, four, it means that the Taylor series expansion actually terminates after four powers of this extra coordinate. And so this is the typical way that we write a superfield. However, in writing these uh, coefficients, v1, v2, v3, and v4, uh, I've written them as if they are tensors with respect to their spinner indices. That doesn't particularly illustrate their properties under Lorentz transformations. So alternatively, <coughs> for uh, v2, uh, v3, and v4, we have this expression where we uh, expand over two of the indices, over gamma matrices, as you can see here. <coughs> I'm doing uh, V2, uh, we expand them over gamma matrices and then write the coefficient functions as well-defined representations of the Lorentz group. Um, so this process, first of all, I'd like to, for reasons that will become clear later, I'm gonna go back and separate this superfield into its beta independent pieces, linear piece, quadratic, cubic, and quartic pieces. If D were larger, of course, these, uh, this expansion would continue. Now I'm going to later introduce you to uh, something called an adinkra, which we're going to find has a very simple definition, but the way that one makes the contact between what is in an adinkra or ultimately what's in a superfield is by using a, 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 an expansion in terms of what's called the superspace or covariant derivative. And so we have the component fields are in one-to-one -one correspondence to this derivative, derivative expansion. If we consider the irreducible representations with respect to the Lorentz group, it goes as one, four, one, one, four, and uh, one. In this mid-level, there are six uh, fields, a G, uh, a space-time vector, a pseudo-scalar, and a scalar. Now, some years ago, in 2004, um, I, I was frustrated with the fact that there are problems in supersymmetry that no one has solved in the entire almost now 50 year history of the subject. And most people don't worry about these problems, but since I'm, you know, since I'm an old professor, I can pretty much worry about, choose to worry about what I want to worry about as opposed to what uh, people deem important. So in 2004, I started uh, trying to create a, a method for solving some issues with respect to supersymmetry. Now, I haven't solved those issues yet, but they've led us to some very powerful insights on this question of identifying uh, component fields, and that's what I'm going to do today. So in uh, 2004, I was actually in Tehran. I'm sorry, I was actually in Tbilisi uh, in the nation of Georgia, a couple hundred miles more north of Tehran, Iran. And I was reading uh, the archive, which is a normal habit for a physicist. And then, um, I saw a paper written by uh, a physicist named Michael Fox and one of his collaborators. I was very intrigued by the paper because it discussed some items that looked very similar to some work that I had done with my graduate student, Lubna Rana, in 1995. And so I sent a message to Michael and uh, directed him to the published versions of my research. He um, started asking me questions. I started answering them and asking him questions. And before we knew it, even though we had not met, 
he had written a paper, uh, basically because he had taken, uh, made notes of all our questions going back and forth. We had written a paper in which we explained that there, that if one thinks about a theory like 11 dimensional supergravity, you can think about it as sitting at the apex of a pyramid. And as we go down towards the ground level of this pyramid, what we're doing is reducing the dimensions of space-time borders. So the idea was that there's some, that there, we expected there to exist some kind of holographic-like property so that if you imagine the sun shining on the apex of this pyramid, it would cast a shadow onto the ground. And so we concluded that if you study supersymmetrical theories in high dimensions, they must have some kind of remnant that contains uh, data and information about them in a theory that has low dimensions, including d equals zero for that matter, but certainly at d equal one. So this was our motivation. And our idea was that the, the problems that you can't solve in high dimensions, maybe you can get insight by looking at them in very low dimensions. And so that was uh, create, so that was, we created what we call the Dinkras. It's a sort of a graphical technology to study supersymmetric representation theory. The name is actually uh, taken from a word in West Africa. Uh, Adinkras in West Africa are a, a set of, it's a symbol, they are symbols in a symbolic language. And so if you look at these symbols, you just think they're pretty designed, but they're actually, uh, they actually have hidden meaning. So we were talking about some kind of graphs, because we're going we're gonna to find out Adinkras are graphs that have hidden meaning. How do we do the projection? In the most naive way possible. Uh, you know that if we, this is the Einstein's light cone, if we're at the point of the observer, we can affect anything in the future light cone by sending a signal that travels fast, the speed of light or slower, and vice versa, events in the past can affect up, us by signals that travel the speed of light and show slower. So what we said was, look, in field theory, what you're really trying to do is predict the uh, behavior of fields in this forward light. That's, that's a problem for supersymmetry that no one has actually solved, uh, at least to my satisfaction. So what we did is said, okay, instead, let us project, let us, instead of trying to solve the theory of the entire future light bulb, just try to solve the theory along a line uh, uh, into the future on the light cone. And if this is a straight line, you can use a Lewis transformation to transform to a temporal axis. And therefore, you instead of having uh, a field theory, you have a theory which depends only on a dynamical time-like variable. So that's the basic uh, uh, mechanism. And when you, when you do that, you get led to graphs like this. I went through the discussion of the scalar superfield in four dimensions, and you'll perhaps remember that we saw the numbers one, followed by four, followed by one, four, one, followed by four, and one. So if you apply this technique of just taking the light cone and apply it to an arbitrary, uh, to the general scale of superfield, you wind up with a diagram like this, if you re represent it in a graphical way. So this is what we mean by an adinkra. But in fact, this is an, a collapsed adinkra. Because in fact, uh, anytime you see uh, a node with a multiplicity attached to it, it means that you can do a further separation so that you separate any, uh, any uh, node with a higher than one multiplicity into separate nodes. And that's what we've done here. So these four nodes you see in the middle here are represented by the collapsed node here. And in fact, these are the objects that we've actually been studying both with our graduate students and collaborators, you know, even some undergraduates uh, since, uh, since Michael and I came up with this uh, construction. So these are graphs in the sense that mathematicians study graphs. They have rules about uh, for their construction. And they, in fact, have an extraordinary array of properties associated with it. Uh, for example, error correcting uh, codes are actually part of uh, the theory of these objects. Uh, Bailey pairs, Groton uh, 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 Deeks, uh, descent don't fall. These are, in fact, examples of descent. They are actually the kinds of graphs that uh, uh, Groton Deeks uh, 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 created to talk about the properties of Riemannian surfaces. So. By this very simple trick, we were led to extraordinarily rich mathematical background. And I've been studying this with uh, a bunch of my mathematical colleagues for over a decade. And these objects keep having uh, uh, revealing surprises. 
currently with one of my graduate with one of my graduate students actually on this uh, Zoom session, we're studying the issue of whether quantum error correcting codes can be are somehow embedded in these objects. So they have been extraordinarily rich to study. Now I remind you uh, that if you think of if you looked at that diagram, you'll 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 see that. We went from level zero, let me go back. Here's level zero, level one, level two, level three, and level four. So there are all the levels of this diagram. Um, and if we look at the multiplicity of nodes, it was one, four, one, four plus one, four, and one. And so these levels correspond exactly to the grasp coordinates that you would see in a superfield approach. So height in these diagrams, uh, one imagines that the height is fixed by an integer, but height in these diagrams corresponds to the theta expansion uh, that you would do in ordinary superfield language. Uh, there's a property of these graphs uh, that we, is not well understood, which in fact is the reason I, uh, I uh, was motivated to consider these graphs. That initial graph that I showed, showed you can actually be decomposed. And this is in fact where error correcting codes come in, because error correcting codes of the initial graph actually govern the structure of the subgraphs into which the decomposition uh, can be made. Now, the operating factor in this decomposition is that supersymmetry was realized on the parent graph. We still want supersymmetry realized into these de decomposed graphs. And it turns out that demand is equivalent to assigning uh, a role for error correcting codes as you separate the graph. And in fact, uh, if I can use my cursor, in some sense, what happens is these two nodes here are the two nodes that you see here. Um, the, uh, out of the, out of the um, four, the city here, we're gonna sort of, in some sense, borrow one. It becomes this node that leaves a three behind here. And the, these two nodes we take with us in this representation. That leaves behind only this subset of the original graph, but where the multiplicity of the center node is three, and that's this object here. When we try to interpret these things as super, as super fields, remarkably enough, this is the so-called vector multiple, and this is the chiral multiple. They are embedded uh, as a graph in these objects. So we're now gonna jump a, a, a fair distance because I gave you a really quick introduction to the idea of a thinkers. And we're gonna jump from four dimensional space to 10 dimensional space. Um, so in 10 dimensions, if you look back to the literature, you can find there's this paper in 1982 where uh, Eric Bergshaw and Myers DeRue were studying the issue of the so-called supercurrent in 10 dimensions. They started off with Maxwell theory in 10 dimensions. They constructed its uh, energy momentum tincture and then they look at the super multiplet that contained that energy. And then what they were able to do is to find two multiplets. One of them is 128 plus 128. And you, that number should look familiar because I showed you in terms of minimal representation that number showed up. They also found this other sub multiplet with 5,632 fermions and 5,632 bosons. So this uh, other multiple has really not been studied very much, but interesting uh, from my perspective, working with my students, uh, uh, Hazel Ma and Yangre Hu, we found this same structure by looking at adinkras. In fact, we started with an adinkra that should be appropriate for the reduction from, uh, from 10 dimensions. And we know how to, we know the rules for building these graphs. And so we applied those rules here. And what we found was a 16 story tall graph uh, whose multiplicities go as you see uh, indicated by the red and blue numbers. The lowest node is a singlet. The uh, ne next level nodes, there are 16 of them. There are 120 at the level two, 560 at level three and so forth. And in fact, these uh, multiplicities correspond exactly to the dimensionality of the Lorentz representations that was found in 1982 by uh, Bergshaw and Giroux. So this is sort of a, 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 a post check that the ideas that we're looking at 
which seem very simple-minded, are making connections with very complicated mathematics that one can get at by other means. Now, in order for this all to work out, it turns out that there are some good conditions. What I've written here, the quantity D is the dimensionality of, of a bosonic representation of SO19. Uh, uh, that's the subscript blue. Uh, this is the dimensionality of the representations of some of fermionic representation of SO9. And at each level in the super field, this condition must be met. It must be true. This side of the equation is actually, you can think about as um, simply counting the multiplicity of the theta variables if you want to use that language. But at any level in the super field, this is, of course, wants the uh, multiplicity of the theta levels. The objects that are sitting over here are purely a Dean Craig had their de, uh, de definitions solely in terms of concepts of graphs. And these coefficients B uh, are tell us how reducible the representation is. There, there's no requirement that a particular representation, no a priori requirement that a particular representation should only occur once. In fact, they can occur, uh, can occur and does occur multiple times as you study these sorts of uh, objects. So uh, if we look at our super field, what I'm showing you here in 10 dimensions are the, uh, are again, the uh, multiplicities, except that I'm not showing you the multiplicities. What I'm actually doing here is I'm talking about the various nodes in terms of Dinkin tables. So that's a technique that is used to describe representations of the algebras. And so it turns out that what we're ultimately going to find out is that these, that the nodes that I'm really interested in will be, you can think of them as either Younger Blows or Dinkin labels, but the Dinkin label description is actually much more powerful in that Dinkin labels uh, also allow you to um, easily check these kinds of multiplicity conditions. So, and here, as I said, here it is written in terms of dimensionality of, uh, Ah, I'm sorry. And here I've done something different. Let me go back for a moment. So this is the this is the super field I started from. You'll notice at its lowest level it had the singlet representation. Now, one of the things that is very common in studying representations is the idea that if you give me two representations, I can multiply them to get a third representation. So let's ask the question: What would happen to this representation if I multiplied it by a representation? And what's in that representation? Well, the answer to that question is actually here. Oops, here. I multiplied that initial object by the 120 representation. By the way, if you uh, want to know what 120 representation is with respect to Lorentz uh, representations in 10 dimensions, it's a three form. So it's something that has three vector indices and totally anti-symmetric. So I took the initial representation, I multiplied by this, one of the great things about Dinkin labels or Young to Blows is that they have a natural built-in multiplication product, at least sort of. We actually have to develop some new methods for how to multiply. We're going to see that these red objects correspond to a different set of, a, of a Young to Blows. And so along the way, working with my students, Hazel and Yangre, we invented ways of figuring out how to multiply uh, Dinkin labels associated with bosonic representations with Dinkin labels that are associated with fermionic representation. And so you find this. And what's really interesting about this result here is purely in terms of group theory, you see there is a 54 representation at the second level. Now, why is that interesting? Well, if you think about 10 dimensions and ask about the graviton, the, uh, the um, symmetric the symmetric part of the graviton in 10 dimensions is precisely a 54 dimensional representation of the Lorentz group. And so what we can see is that whatever this superfield is, it has in its component expansion, something that has exactly the algebraic structure of the graviton here, it has it here. And the way these graphs work is they are mirror symmetric. So since there's a 54 here at the third level from the top, it means there's a 54 at the third level, I'm sorry, on the bottom, there's also a 54 at the third level from the top of the superfield. And uh, so this is just the rest of the, rest of the enunciation. Okay. So um, 
we're doing something strange that I've never seen done before, but it all seems to hang together. Mainly, we actually use two distinct types of Dinkin labels uh, in our description of these theories. We use blue Dinkin labels, and those, as I said, correspond to bosonic representations of the Lorentz group, but we use red Dinkin labels uh, to represent spinner representations of the Lorentz group. So, for example, if you take the 60, the spinner in 10 dimensions and multiply that representation by itself, it decomposes into a 10 of the vector, the 120, and the 126 uh, bar. We'll talk about this in a moment. And so uh, you can now do some simple counting. Uh, if you use hooks, or if you use the hooks, uh, the hooks rule, you can figure out that um, you can figure out that this representation on this side, let me tell you how to do that counting. Um, these objects, these red objects, since they're spinners, they correspond to indices that take on range from one to 16. So on this side of the calculation, you use the usual hooks rule where you say, aha, the range of the indices are one to 16. When we put the boxes on the other side, the range of the indices there are only uh, one to 10. And so uh, you can actually show that just by simple counting that this representation where the indices take on, take on values one to 16 is equal to 136, which is precisely the uh, sum of the two numbers that you see here. So it makes sense to talk about starting with two classes of young tableaus, but where the multiplication of one of them closes on some of the representations of the second one. I, I've never seen this done in a textbook, but as I said, we don't seem to run into any mathematical consistencies. And by this means, you can prove something. Since this symmetrical representation is the 10 and the 26 bar, and since when we multiplied the 16 times the 16, we saw a 10 and the 26 bar, it means that the anti-symmetrical representation must be what's left over. And so it makes sense to talk about a wedge product taken on young to blows. Uh, this 126 that I was talking about, if you're in 10 dimensions, there's a, a poly or gamma matrix, whichever matrix, whichever you might want to describe it, which has five vector indices. And it can come in dual and self, self dual and anti self dual, dual varieties. As a graph, it's this, and this one with the minus sign is the 106 bar that we were talking about. Um, you can continue to play this game. You can say, well, gee, if you want to know the wedge product of four of these, how can I figure it out? And working with my graduate students, uh, as I said, we actually went through the pain of showing that if you know how to take the normal product of young to blows and you successively decompose them in clever ways, you can figure out that there's a well, a consistent, well-defined wedge product of the young to blows. Those are the things I'm showing here on the bottom. So why do we go through all this trouble? Well, because we're trying to make progress where people have given up. And so if you're working on something no one else is working on, you get to make the rules of the game. The rules of the, war is, uh, the, rules of the road are yours to propose. As long as they don't lead to mathematical inconsistencies, they're good rules for the road. So let's jump now to 11 dimensions. Remember I showed you before an expansion of a superfield in four dimensions. So now let me try to write an expansion of a superfield in 11 dimensions. Remember, there are 4 billion component fields in this thing. So clearly I am not going to sit and write every possible term, but I'm gonna give you, I'm, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna tell you the form of the object, and then I'm gonna give you a recursion formula so that if you want, depending on how strong you are, you can work to any order to your heart's content to figure out uh, an expression for superfield. So first of all, my claim is that if you're in 11 dimensions, you can start from the first line here. Now I've introduced some auxiliary variables which are actually uh, quadratics in the gra uh, Gaston coordinates. And I've classified them according to their Lorentz representation. Uh, remember when we were in four dimensions, we found out that uh, quadratic things could be rewritten in terms of uh, te spinner tensors and, and then bosonic fields with well-defined Lorentz transformations. So we're doing the same thing here. So how do I find the rest of the superfield since I haven't told you what's up there? Well, it turns out there's a, you can bootstrap your way. There's a recursion formula. Namely, look at, look at the linear term. 
which is sitting right here. And you want to get to the quadratic terms, and the quadratic terms are all sitting here on the same line. What you can think about doing is taking the linear term and replacing it by uh, a, cup, a Duff and Kimmer Pateau field, which is these objects, times a Grassman coordinate. What does that buy you? Well, if you start it with something that's linear in theta and you do this replacement, then you're clearly going to get something uh, quadratic in theta. And so, in fact, you generate the entire quadratic term by doing this Duff and Kimmer Pateau replacement. Now, uh, so that gets you to linear. And if you actually do the counting, you'll find out it works just fine. Uh, remember I told you that uh, we're in 11 dimensions. We have this well-defined wedge product. We can calculate its dimensions by Hooke's rule. And then looking at the irreducible decomposition of bosonic fields in 11 dimensions, you can see both sides match. What about the quadratic term? Okay, so now we've generated quadratic term. How do you get it to a cubic term? Well, it turns out, once again, there's a very simple rule for getting to cubics. Namely, each one of these bosonic fields that you have at the quadratic or level gets replaced by a Grassmann coordinate times a new fermion field. So if you do this replacement here, then since this is already quadratic in theta, this replacement makes this a cubic term. Similarly here, here. And so now you have a new cubic part term to the super field. This process can be done as many times as you have strength to do it. So in this way, you can get an expression for a superfield in 11 dimensions. Now it's undaily, it covers many pages, but this recursion formula is well defined. But there are problems. The problems have to do with, is it, and it's, this recursion formula gives, certainly gives you some kind of representation, but is it an irreducible representation? in the sense of, uh, not in the strong sense, but in the weak sense? And the answer is no. Uh, the first sign of trouble is, uh, you can think about what I'm doing as taking the Grassman variables and asking, how do you construct well-defined representations of Lorentz group using the Grassman variables? So you can see there's a 5,280 dimensional fermionic representation, which I can represent by this thing. If I put an irreducibility condition, and this irreducibility condition is that uh, if I take a one gamma trace on this object, it should vanish. There is a, there is a 3,520 representation. You can show that that is consistent if one, instead of just taking the grass report, it, multiply a vector, a gamma matrix with a vector index, contracting on a vector in the tier, contracting dependencies, and then again, impose gamma traces on this, and it exactly will give you that number. But there's a simpler expression that you could write, namely this. And if you impose gamma traces on it, it also has this uh, dimensionality. And so the first thing you run into uh, by using this recursion formula is that it's not clear how to write the thing so that, uh, and in fact, the real question is, are these things independent or not? Are these actually different objects? It will turn out that, uh, they, that, these, that, that these two objects are the same. It, to prove this relies on Pierce identities, the same thing here, so that in fact, although I give you lots of choices here, if you go through the Pierce identity analysis, you can show it, it's good enough just to use the things here or, uh, or to swap any, you can swap this one for this one and then use the same column. Any of them will work, but the point is you don't know that until you do the Pierce identity analysis. And then at the end of the day, you find out that uh, Wedge product taken on the red young to blows can be calculated by using the Hooke's rule. It gives you the number of 4,960. On the other side, if you actually look at just adding the representations that I've shown here, if you add 3,520 to 1408 to 32, that also gives you 4,960. So at the third level of the super field, it's only this, this, and this that occur, not the most general expression. So now you can see what the difficulties are. So the main message of my talk here is, as I said, I, I've never seen in the literature anyone explicitly try to write out a scalar superfield field of uh, Working with my graduate students about a year, just over a year ago, we made the attempt and we found that any kind of reasonable, well, what you might think of, well, anything that I felt was reasonable always led to this problem. So, the question becomes, again, the question I asked you at the beginning of the talk, what's inside of a high-dimensional superfield? How do you find it?
Okay, so in 11 dimensions, uh, this is the challenge. Uh, it's something that is 30, 32, uh, it's a 32 level uh, graph, if you think about in terms of graph. At each level, uh, the number of independent degrees of freedom are governed by the Hooke's law applied to the red uh, tableaus, which describe the spinners. Um, but how do you actually find out what happens? Remember, I earlier pointed out this business that at any level, what must go on is that the dimensionality at that level is given by the dimensionality as determined by the representations of the Lorentz group plus some multiplicity factors. Now, this is a result actually that I've known about for years. I'm sorry, I understood for years that the, that the uh, solution must have this form, but the question always was, what in the world, how do you determine these, how do you a priori determine these multiplicity factors? Uh, in the first attempt that I did, which was maybe seven or eight years ago, I thought the answers might be unique. And so working with my daughter, who wrote some code for me, uh, we set up uh, a problem uh, looking at trying to solve these conditions in a very simple uh, test case. And what we found was that there were multiple solutions. There is not a unique solution. And so it, it was clear at that point that, it, that you would need to have some systemic and systematic way to determine these uh, multiplicity factors. So uh, in 2019, I, uh, in 2017, I moved from University of Maryland to Brown University. And uh, when I first came here, I met a young graduate student who approached me about becoming her advisor. And then the next year, the same thing happened. So now I have two graduate students, uh, Hazel uh, Mock and uh, Yangre Hu, who will be graduating next year. But since they asked for a problem and I was worried about this problem, we decided to tackle this problem. What, what mathematical principle determines those multiplicity factors that in some sense, what I've been doing for you uh, so far, you can think of it as this kind of a phenomenology. Namely, I was looking at mathematical structures and then asking questions about, um, about what can it be? I didn't have an a priori principle for deriving this thing. And no one I know, by the way, has ever supplied such a principle. But what has been said is superfields are expansions of theta coordinates and x's, but no one has actually tried to do it in these high dimensions. And if you do, you'll run into the difficulty we've had to. So uh, after much effort, uh, and in fact, uh, uh, there are other problems that go on when you take this uh, sort of phenomenological approach. And working with Hazel and John Gray, we actually elucidated the kinds of problems that arise. So if um, flying by the seat of your pants as a theoretical physicist doesn't get you where you want to go, you go to talk to mathematicians, you go consult with real mathematicians. And so, you know, we all understood that uh, since the dimensions of the spinners are 32 dimensions, remember the 30, uh, you know, there's 32 components to a spinner in the dimensions, it meant that the representation theory of SO32 must have something to do with the problem that we're looking at of branching issues. And in fact, whatever the final answer for these B coefficients are, you could say they must embed in the representation theory of SO32. And if that's the case, the most obvious thing to do is say, okay, I wanna look at the branching rules from SO32 to SO10. Because why SO10? Well, because SO10 is where our superfield is with, I'm sorry, SO11 is where our superfield is because we're talking about 11 mission supergravity but the spinners happen to have 32 dimensions. So these two, obviously these two lead groups are picked out as having relevance to the problem we're looking at. So uh, we need something called a projection matrix. And the way to, one way to go about it, uh, finding this, and as I said, it's, it's my, the creativity of my graduate students that I have to pay great tribute here uh, to, is to look at the weight system for SO32 and write down its weight system. It has actually 32 weight vectors. All of, uh, as you can see, you, you can't do this sort of stuff unless you're into really deeply into group theory. So 
Some of us actually like group theory and have studied it rather extensively. So SL32 has 32 weight vectors for its representation. While the weight system uh, for, uh, for uh, SO10 also has 32 weight vectors. However, however, they're very drastically different. For the SO32 weight vectors, they, are, they have 31 digits in them. So we just listed the first, and you're supposed to fill in all the rest of them until you get to the end. And the way to think about these things is, one way to think about them is what you do is you, you start with, in some sense, this thing and just keep pushing them to the right until you exhaust it and get the minus one down to five. So that gives you the, the, weight, the weight system for SO32. For, I cannot give you a simple algorithm for finding the weight system uh, in uh, SO10, but it has 32 weight vector, uh, 32 weights. And the, but they're only five units long, they're not 31 units long. And so one has to basically consult with one's best group, uh, group theory mathematical friend or go read some books on group theory and you can find these things out. So how does that help us? Well, the idea basically is that if you know these weight vectors and I've actually sort of given them to you, you can stack the ones in SO32 all on top of each other. That will then give you a matrix, which is 32 entries across its, uh, its rows and 32 entries on its height. On the other hand, for SO11, this thing will be five entries across its rows and 32 entries on its height. Now, because of those numbers, you can take the transpose of this object and the transpose will have be a 31 by 32 matrix. This thing is already a, uh, a 32 by five matrix. And so if you multiply the two, you're clearly gonna get, a, I'm sorry, I said 32, I meant 31. You're gonna get a 31 by five matrix. And this is the required projection operator that will take you from the weight system in, uh, in uh, SO32 to the weight system in SO11. So, as I said, I've got strong graduate students and they can certainly figure this stuff out. The other thing that's rather interesting and that was actually very important for us to use is a mathematical concept called plethism. And plethism is really, the simplest way to think about plethism, at least for me, is if you have an arbitrary, uh, if you have some arbitrary uh, Lie group you look at the forms that are in it and you ask yourself, how can I look at the embedding of forms in some sense? And so uh, this will lead you to the use of character functions over the groups. And you can uh, look to build uh, character polynomials that are anti-symmetric in the a square of the representations or uh, characteristic polynomials that are, I'm sorry, anti-symmetric in the square, rep square representation or the ones that are symmetrical. And, the solution to this problem, for words, for reasons I, I don't know, our name is named plethism. Now, for us, plethism actually plays a very interesting role, which I will return to. So, plethism, together with branching rules, actually allow us to look inside of superfields. Now, we think we're the first people to have this capacity to, if you give us a superfield, we know how to look directly at what's inside of it without doing a theta expansion, purely in terms of group theory, group theoretic concepts. So here's the, uh, here I'm gonna give you the result. This is what we found for the superfield in 11 dimensions, at least in low dimension. It starts off with a one, it's a 32, a one, 30, a 165 and a 30. And remember when I did my theta expansion, I actually showed you these things came by this recursion argument. Uh, I had to work with the superfields, I had to work a little, a little bit harder to show that these are the only things that occur here. But if you start with branching rules, you find out these are the only, uh, that you only have one of these representations, and therefore these multiplicity factors are identically one. And so by this means, you can actually fix all of those B coefficients that I showed you that were sort of phenomenological in the approach that I took before. However, if you work sufficiently high, you find out not all the B coefficients are unity. Sometimes they diverge from unity, but this is all controlled by the 
projection applied uh, uh, to the bran uh, branching ratios. So we've actually worked it through to the 16th level, which I show you here. Uh, of course, don't really look at this because the numbers are horrific, but the idea is that we now have systematically understood the mathematics here. And so we can, on the basis of branching rules, and uh, we can tell you how, what representations and what is their multiplicity at any level of the superfield. Some of you might have some issues about the multiplicity being greater than one. I'm gonna to return to that at the end of this talk. And, oh, by the way, here's the 60th level. Oh, how do I know there's a graviton there? Well, at the 60 level, there's a 65. And at the component level, as I'm gonna show you shortly, we know that the symmetrical part of a graviton is a 65 dimensional representation uh, in, 11, in an 11 dimensional space time. There's also, there are also a couple of singlets, and this is actually pretty important. Now we haven't actually gotten to the point of being able to distinguish Poincare supergravity from um, conformal supergravity, but this 65 is actually the conformal part of the 11 dimensional uh, graviton. If you're gonna ever get to, um, if, to a Poincare theory, you're gonna need singlets. And so the theory is very nice and it provides you with more than one singlet to try to construct that. We haven't even done that. The next thing I'm gonna show you is that this 165 is important. So I'm gonna underline it because in 11 dimensional supergravity, in fact, the uh, bosonic fields is a graviton, a three form, this course, one of these must correspond to that three form. And at the next level up, the conformal gravity, gravitino, whoops, the conformal gravitino, I guess I'm, and this, one of these 32s is the gravitino traits. So all of the, all of the necessary representations to build a supergravity theory occurs in an 11 dimensional scalar superfield at levels 16 and 17. And by the way, these are newly discovered facts. These are not in the literature. The only place you'll find these statements are in the research papers I've done with Hazel and Yangre. And we've derived this, as I said, by using these uh, branching uh, methods and methods. So we know that we, I have not answered the question I started out, set out to do. I can tell you exactly what's in this super field. Now in this list, I can tell you at the level, first level, there's a one field, second level, three, three, eight. At the broadest level, there are 296 fields and that's at level 16. Why do I stop at level 16? Well, because super fields always have this uh, property that they're diamond shaped. And by that mean, you start from the lowest level, you go to the maximum, then it decreases exactly uh, the opposite way. It's like flipping this table. So at the 17th level of the superfield, there are also 225 components. At the 18th level of the superfield, at 247, until you get to the top of the superfield, there's a single. So as I said, we can tell you exactly what, super, what component fields are there, and we know precisely what representations they fall. Let me talk about multiplicities. The fact that the multiplicities sometimes are greater than one is equivalent to the statement that the object that we are working with, that we have generated, is a reducible representation. Now, I don't know yet an algorithm for how to tease that out, but at the end of the talk, I'll tell you how I know this. You know, I told you dinkers are graphs. Well, this is what the first five levels of the 11 dimensional dinker looks like. Um, oh, I'm sorry, six levels. So at the lowest level of singlet, 32. Uh, the black and white uh, nodes represent bosons and fermions. Anything that's open is a boson, anything that's closed is a fermion. One of the interesting things to note is, let's go to the third level here. And you can see there's a fermion here and it only connects to the 330, the 165 and the singlet. It doesn't connect to the 1144, the 4290, the 5,005, the 7,865, nor the 17,160. How do we know that? This is where plethism comes in. You can use these arguments of plethism to figure out the connections that the fields have at each level. You could have done the counting of fields without plethism, right? And here is uh, the same diagram, but this time using the uh, Dinkin labels. Well, I told you we're missing something. Uh, 
in the uh, graviton we have found. In our, in the superfield we have found, there's a 65 at the same level as a singlet, so that could constitute uh, a conformal graviton plus its trace, but there's no 55. The absence of a 55 means that we must be describing some sort of theory where a priori you're working the gauge where you have set the anti-symmetric part of the graviton to zero. Now this problem doesn't afflict the gravitino because as I showed you previously, there's a 320 and a 32 at the same level and those are what you need to describe the gravitino. So we have seen this problem before in uh, superfuel supergravity, uh, a theory where you could find most of the graviton but not as anti-symmetric part. And the solution previous was take the superfuel that you started with and, and express it as the gas derivative of an independent superfuel. And that you know, this was first found in four dimensions in equal two supergravity by Warren Siegel and I when we were postdocs at Caltech. And so we expect that same solution to work here. We also have studied uh, extensively these sorts of constructs in 11 dimensions, I'm sorry, 10 dimensions. And now I'm gonna use 10 dimensions as a way to teach and get some insights. So in 10 dimensions, if you uh, follow this uh, path, uh, the graph, as I said before, is a 16 order graph. Here I've expressed it directly in terms of Dinkin labels, as opposed to using numbers to tell you, uh, in, as opposed to telling you uh, the dimensionality of the representation. So this is uh, what one of these objects looks like when we express it purely in terms of the young to blows which describe the representations of the object. And here's the rest of it. As I pointed out before, it's got this pyramid shape. It starts with a singlet, 16, then uh, a three form. If you look at the top of it, it ends with a singlet, a 16, and a three form. So these things always have this pyramid shape, but now we see the, we can see the superfluid. Now, one of the things about seeing these objects, although they, I'm told that the human intellect has an incredible amount of our information processing capacity tied to vision. And so one thing about graphical images is that they allow that part of your subconscious mind that pays attention to graphical information. It can kind of you can kind of recruit it to do mathematics. That's why one of the really powerful things about graph theory. And so seeing these objects, uh, at least for me, led me to start thinking about other, uh, other possibilities for their use. And so here, again, I've reconstructed it uh, in a different way so you see, see it. And, uh, and when we use the word a dinker with a Y, we mean a dinker where the nodes are dinking labels. So that's the only difference between the ordinary dinkers I first introduced in the base. You can collect all of these objects together. And you can say for, you can have some intuitions that it, it might be a good idea to collect all of them. You need some kind of parameter to tell you what the height was in the graph. And I'm sorry, this actually should be an L, not an H, I just noticed it. But you can introduce a parameter that counts how high up in the graph you are. And you can assemble this object, which uh, Hazel and Yagre and I did in one of our papers. And I started thinking about this thing as a genome. Now, what do I mean by a genome? Well, in biology, a, a genome is a, a collection of molecules that determine the form of a, a more complicated biological entity. And so, I started thinking about this object as this is the thing that actually tells you what's inside of a superfield. Now, there are no, this is not a function of X, so it's not like you're gonna use this to do dynamics, unless you're very tricky, because I do actually know a way to do that. But at the first glance, you say, well, this is where I capture the information in terms of Lorentz group. And what's really interesting about this is there's no space-time coordinates at all in this thing. And yet, I have the information about the representation of the fields, and that information is carried by the fact that I have Dinkin labels in this object. Uh, if you actually want to know what happened with fields, well, the fields actually pair up with these various terms. And the way they pair up is very interesting. Namely, you can think of one by the uh, single red or you can think about it, it actually has a hidden spinner index 
And so what's happening is I'm contracting the Skinner index on the Dinkin label with the field variable. This blue three form actually has three hidden vector indices. So I think about contracting those objects with the, the three form that's in a super field. And so this way, I get, um, I get a sense of how this object collects field components to become a super field. Uh, if you do that for the collection of nodes here, you find these objects. And then in the final exercise working with both Hazel and Yangre, we use the fact that uh, when you have the Dinkin uh, labels, you also have a set of irreducibility conditions that uh, must be applied to them. And since I'm thinking about these indices as contracting to those indices on the Dinkin labels, it means that these labels must also satisfy the same set of irreducible projection conditions. So then we went ahead and checked that that was the case. And we derived from the Dinkin labels, the irreducible projection conditions on the field components. It all worked out beautifully. And so this intuition that the super field is in a sense a contraction between this object, which I call a genome, and a and field space is borne out at this level. Now, at this stage, let me talk about uh, on-shell supergravity theories in 10, in 10 dimensions. There are three of them. There's the integral one supergravity theory, there is the type 2a supergravity theory and the type 2b supergravity theory. If, now these are component fields, but you know, one of the wonderful things about uh, Dinkin labels, they don't care what, what you're talking about. They just care about what representation of Lorentz group you're talking about. So uh, in our conventions we're describing uh, spinners, the Dinkin label that corresponds to this field is this particular Dinkin label. The Gravitino Dinkin label looks like this. If we look for a singlet, well, here's the singlet Dinkin label. Uh, the two inequal one supergravity has a two form. Here's the Dinkin label for a two form, and it has a graviton. Here it is. Now, what's really interesting is if anyone starts with a component level theory, I know now how to take the components they have and extract from them the Dinkin label description of those components. On the other hand, totally independent of what's going on with components, I have this thing I call the genome which I can then query, do you have these components in you? And not only can I query if the components occur, I can also query at what level do these components occur? In particular, for supersymmetry to work uh, in a superfield, these things have to be at adjacent levels. And so when I query an adinkra, I can ask, do these representations occur in an, adinkra, uh, in an adjacent level out of the construction technique that I've used? And the same for type two and uh, A and B. So for the first time, we have a mechanism that if you give me a set of component fields, I can give you candidate super fields in which to embed these objects by matching up the Dinkin labels. It's a little bit like forensic science. You know, uh, I don't know how many of you are forensic science fans. People, a lot of, a lot of people know about uh, both fingerprint evidence as well as DNA evidence. You know, the, you know, the perpetrator left some, uh, some DNA at the site. I take a sample of that DNA and then I try to match it. And what do I match it to? Well, I take the, uh, I take the full uh, genome for, from, uh, uh, from a suspect class and then I match only the small piece of the genome that I have from the crime scene to the large and then that gives me a suspect that I can begin to investigate in greater depth. Same thing with fingerprints. At a crime scene, you have a piece of a fingerprint, you try to match it with the entire fingerprint, and it gives you a hint. So these kind of forensics methods, for the first time, and to my knowledge, we can now apply to problems in supersymmetry, now that we know what the targets are that these things need to match. And let me also pay tribute to my graduate students, because while we were doing this, we created a lot of interesting new math that needs to have other people studying. And one of the things that we did was look at decompositions because that was very important for our branching ratios. And we had a, we found a new visual way to do that. So if you started with a five form, uh, say an SO10, uh, it, I'm sorry, five form SO32, uh, you in going down to SO10, you will run decompose it. So to me, the most natural thing, I'm sorry, not a five form. This is a symmetric rank five uh, tensor in uh, SO10. 
So to me, one of the most natural things to do is if I was a physicist, I would think of this as a field with five indices. I would contract two indices with uh, Minkowski metrics, and then I'd do it again, I'd have one index left, and that would be a 10. So the idea is that the contraction that we physicists do, can you can think of it graphically as tying boxes together. So here is the initial graph where one set of boxes is tied together. Here it is with two. And now how do we calculate dimensions? Well, there's only one free box here, so I use its law, it's a 10. When I, uh, when I uh, let go of one of these ties, I have to, uh, I have to subtract, I can use Hooke's law on the three, but then I have to subtract out the, uh, I have to fact, use the fact that I've subtracted out, and then I have to subtract out the fact that the thing I subtracted out has a piece of it missing. When you do that, you get a 210. And you do this again, you find out these exactly line up with more complicated ways to describe branching numbers. So we played some, had some fun playing the games. And here's another diagram, you can check it. Uh, this method has not been extended for arbitrary diagrams. That's an open, unsolved problem. And we also know how to do this for diagrams where there are uh, fermionic ink invaders hanging around. So I've identified for you this object I call the genome. I claim that it is the secret to knowing what's inside of a superfluid. Uh, one of the things about the way that I wrote it it was, it was suggested to me when I wrote it, which is this thing should really be thought about as some kind of a power series, but that at the end of the day will involve um, wedge products of the Grassman representations and will also involve the fermionic representations. So the most net, and I can, since I'm going a little bit long, maybe I can come back to their questions about the one skip it. But since I'm going a little bit long, if we look back at four dimensions in this language, it's very clear that these things I'm calling genomes are exponentials of the level parameters I'm introducing times the young to blows for the fermionic representations. In fact, you can think of the level number of times of, of, of the, the young to blows of fermionic representation, you can think of that, that's actually what theta is in the standard language of superfluids. And so it's not surprising that uh, we figured out how to extract these things without theta because in a secret way, we actually are using the representation theory. Of theta. So any superfield in for four dimensional supersymmetry, I claim must have the following structure. It's the exponentiation of the uh, Minimal representation, and here I'm using uh, two component spinners and conjugate two component spinners. Any superfield will simply be the product of these two objects acting on some representation y sub t. This should generate the components for every possible superfield that you can ever write in four dimensional supersymmetry. If you want to get fermionic superfields, you simply change the target that the, this operator acts on to a fermionic representation. You know, we can sh show some examples. As I said, Hazel and Nagri and I have been playing with this thing. And so if you want a chiral superfield, you set the L uh, tilde parameter zero, that leaves you only the L parameter, you expand it out, and there's exactly the field content of the chiral superfield. A complex signal, one vial spinner, and another complex signal. Uh, you can look down here, for example, uh, I'm sorry, in particular, look at this one. This is, uh, again, the same idea. Namely, you take this general operator, you act on a two representation, and you then use this wedge product to do the calculations. You calculate what representations come out. And the representations that you see here are exactly the representations of what's called the matter gravitino multiplet in supersymmetry in four dimensions. But the matter gravitino multiplet for supersymmetry in four dimensions is precisely the gauge parameter of the uh, supergravity prepotential that I first showed you. So supergravity in four dimensions is actually starting to give us some insights to how to, uh, uh, in fact, here's that superfield I was talking about, how to apply these methods to ask a very deep question about high dimensions, namely, what is the supergravity gauge group in 11 dimensions strictly in terms of these graphs 
that we use to anchor our mathematical understanding. That's going to be a lot of fun to track down. And that's something Hazel Younger and I are starting to talk about. Uh, this is all four dimensional stuff, the tides are things that you know. The graviton of four dimensions, the gravitational and the auxiliary and the axial vector, the usual glory. But we're now starting to think about how to use this information that we have in four dimensions to explore the unknown regions of 10 and 11 dimensional super field super gravity with tools that have never existed before. So we think we're on the verge of being able to say things that the field has never seen before. Of course, as an old physicist, I'm very happy about this, but I'm also extraordinarily happy to, and I wish to acknowledge my first two PhD students at Brown University, Ms. Uh, Sesnin Hazel Mock, and Ms. Tangre Yu, who gave a Gong Show presentation recently at the Strings 2021 conference precisely in this work. But of course, since they only had a Gong Show, they could not uh, go into anywhere near the level of detail that I've had fun doing this talk. But maybe they will in the future. Maybe they'll act, I'll loan them, or they can develop their own slide deck because they have their own ways to talk about. They're, they're tremendous people. And I'm telling everyone that these are some very special young folks that, that I've been, uh, I've had the great fortune to work with. Uh, their efforts contribute materially and substantially. Uh, their creativity is breakthrough about finding components, uh, transparency, and high dimension tip fields. My research has been supported by the Ford Foundation Professorship Endowment here at Brown University. I thank you and I'm willing to answer questions if people wish to engage. Okay, thank you very much for your very interesting talk. Questions, please. Uh-huh. Ah. Yes. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, questions. Thank you, Michelle. Uh, yes, Kumar, please. Uh, the, Sravan, please ask your question. Uh, uh, hello, Jim. Hey. Uh, thank you uh, for the nice talk. Uh, well, actually, I don't uh, know much about this field, but I have a naive question because I, from the cosmology point of view, uh, we know from the CMB data and from inflationary observables that uh, at least at the gut scale, I mean, inflation happens at a gut scale so far for the um, present understanding. Uh, we know more or less what are the degrees of freedom, at least. I mean, if we have many fields uh, responsible for inflation or if, the, if we have like more than one field, like more than uh, inflaton, those will appear in the non gaussianities So, and also uh, with respect to gravity, you know, for, uh, there are some constraints uh, from understanding if, if, it is, if it acts as a dark matter or something. So we have a lot of constraints. So in this view, how to understand all this 11 dimensional super gravity? Ah. It constrain anything because you see, we, we, have, we know a lot about from the observations uh, from dark matter and CMB. So, Putting all these things together, we more or less say what are the mass spectrum, at least mass scales of these particles. So what can we learn from this and implement see uh, so, how sure. it is? Okay, so first of all, let me uh, thank you for the question because uh, I, you know, my, since I was invited to speak here, I decided that I wanted to just talk really on the mathematical axis. So first of all, let me just comment to you. I use higher dimensions as a laboratory. Uh, I, don't, I don't use it to talk about real physics. Uh, this process called compactification has got to be applied to any of these high dimensional constructs that anyone uses. And so in some sense, I, I get the luxury of not uh, having to worry about, about the question you raised. Someone's going to have to worry about if this theory is going to be successful. But my point of view, which I've actually expressed many times before, uh, in print is that um, I call myself a higher dimensional refusenik. Uh, some of my uh, Russian colleagues will, will recognize what the term means. I have, I have zero uh, uh, belief that high dimensions will ever be found as part of our physics. And 
part of the reason is actually a strange philosophical reason, which I'll try to explain now. Uh, you see, um, if, if, high, if these high dimensional mathematical constructs are ever to yield a phenomenologically relevant piece of mathematics, it will have to do so through this process we call compactification. That means it's a two-step process. Uh, settling the issues in the higher dimensional theory, that's a mathematical question. And then constructing a compactification technique. Now, the only problem with this latter step is that in terms of uh, philosophy, I don't know how that is a closed question. By that I mean, I know of no group of physicists who have ever asked the question, is there a general theory of compactification? And, if, and at the simplest level, this question is, how do I count the number of methods of compactification? Because if you cannot enunciate the number of ways, then you will never be certain whether your so-called theory uh, is, uh, is ruled out in nature. Because, because if you can't count them, you can't actually make all the predictions. And therefore, you have an incompleteness. So there's a, there's a fundamental incompleteness in the idea that higher dimensional theories are going to be our theory. Because you can't enunciate all of them until you can solve this question of how to count every conceivable, I'm sorry, every mathematically allowed compactification. And this is something that Shelley Glashow was alluding to 20, uh, more, 25 years ago. He, he talked about this in this uh, video called The Elegant Universe. And at the time I was very skeptical, but over the years I thought a lot about what he said and he's exactly right. Until someone wrestles with this question, you know, we have a high dimension, we have a low dimension, best count, I mean, it's the counting problem. Count for me every way to compact by it. Because if you can't count, then you can't tell me that you have ruled out all possible high dimensional theories. So that's the, that's the big secret hole in the entire higher dimensional ethos, which uh, goes on. Now, that doesn't say that, that you, can, you can take a stab and say, well, I like this. And then you might get lucky and guess that's the way the universe works. But that is not a complete argument of how physics typically works. If, uh, if you look at gauge theory, we know how to write every possible gauge theory. We can write different matter spectrum. We can write different gauge groups. And therefore, we can, in principle, count every, I mean, it's, a, it's an infinity, but the point is it's, these are countable infinities of theories. This is what's missing in higher dimensional approaches to physics. Uh, okay. Can I ask another question? So, short question. Well, I'm not. You, I, I'm happy that you should ask our host what you're allowed to ask. Okay. <laughs> maybe, maybe um, just uh, wait a little bit. Our next question first came from Igor Valovich. Igor, please. And Sravan, you will ask uh, later, just after. Yes, thank you very much, Jim, for the nice talk. If, if I understand correctly. You want to see the to find the general picture of all possible representations and multiplicities, is it? Well, we believe yes. We believe we know how to generate graphs of every supersymmetric representation. I, I'm not a you know I'm not really a mathematician, so I don't have a proof. But I don't know the whole of the arguments that are used. Okay, can you comment about the following problem? Ultraviolet divergences in supergravity by using superfuels. What is current I'm sorry, I couldn't catch uh, deriving matrices, you said? Ultraviolet divergences in supergravity by using superfuels. What is current status? I would have to think about that, Igor. I, I don't have an answer right off, the, right off the bat. It's a very good question, by the way. Okay, thank you. Sure. Okay, please, Ravan, ask your question. No, it's just a, a small question related to what you said about compactification. Actually, there is a very strong debate in string theory, string theoreticians now, uh, whether how to realize disiter vacuum. Oh yes. And uh, the so the community is divided like. Uh, 
well there there are certain kind of complexifications so like kklt right. uh, and they realize this is a vacuum but there is other uh, opinions say that there cannot be any this is a vacuum this is indeed related to actually what we observe now is something close to this is a vacuum for sure right. so could you comment something about I it i i can yeah. actually uh jeez uh in 2000 In 2000, I actually wrote a paper called "Is Supersymmetry Quintessentially Challenged?" Because we call it quintessence, right? And so the title of the paper is. I, I'm and look. I'm. How do I say this? Nature, the mathematics of supersymmetry does not easily admit the set of vacuums. There's a very simple. If you, I can send you a link to my very old paper. I can give you almost a two-line proof that supersymmetry hates. The idea of a dissipating vacuum. Uh, so there is there is a great tension with the observations, right? The observations tell us we have a dissipating geometry, and uh, the uh, idea that supersymmetry is relevant to, uh, to our universe. I do not know how this tension is going to be resolved, uh, but I'm very much aware. And as I said, I wrote one of the earliest papers I know about on this subject. I'll send you the link if you send me, you know, just remind me. You know, Okay, thank you. Okay, the next question is from Alexey Koshelnik. Alexey, please. Thank you. Thanks for your very impressive talk. First, I wanted to ask you uh, when you came down to four dimensions, you presented very neat uh, picture how everything is looking in terms of exponentials. Yeah. So, so indeed, it was let's say much more. Uh, let's say understandable in the sense that uh, at least uh, uh, even I'm being from another uh, domain could realize what's going on. It's not so um, cumbersome. And my question is, what happens in five dimensions? Very popular thing now to study yeah, five dimensions uh, and the relations. Yeah. So as I said, the, the graphs associated with hard disks are these complicated uh, billion plus node graphs. The, the mathematics is very clear on that. Um, the only way I know how to make physics by, by, by progress is that computers don't care that you have a billion nodes. In fact, the hard the hardware and software that we, the three of us, as I said, myself and Yangre and Hazel, the hardware and software that we use runs on a laptop. It doesn't require any extraordinary computational infrastructure to derive these uh, these insights. So in higher dimensions, the only thing I know, in fact, the things that I will be doing in the future is wrestling with these billion plus node graphs using computers as my eyes and ears, because uh, the ideas, we think that we have some, uh, some hold of the ideas that have to be there based on the structures. Um, as for what's happened until I do it, I, 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 I have no idea. What's Maybe we'll run into some of the problem. I suspect not. The trick is actually to, to find clever ways to think about these billion plus objects in terms of very simple objects. And that's what we've done by introducing this idea of the genome. Our claim is that the genome is capturing accurately the mathematics of these far more complicated objects. I see. Thank you very much. Sure. Uh, you are muted. Uh, if you you have to unmute. Yeah. Sorry. Yes. Thank you. Um, uh, you know there are some uh, in very interesting in, in applications of supersymmetry to condense matter. Ah. There are some model people use non-relativistic physics. So I would like to ask you if your technique can apply for such type of physics, because maybe this is more close to uh, and more uh, the faster way to, reali to re sure. some realistic so physics. The answer is yes. We have not tried to, let me put it this way. The graphs that I have dis uh, discussed today are, are strictly tied to uh, Minkowskian signature space times. However, uh, you can, there are truncations of these graphs 
so that you can apply them to Euclidean space times. Mm -hmm. You know, these graphs don't really, let me say it this way. If someone has a theory where supersymmetry is realized, then the truncation that I talked about can be applied to that theory, whether it was Lorentzian signature, Minkowski signature, what have you. And so if you have a theory that has some kind of supersymmetry, all it needs is some kind of supersymmetry, these graphs can be constructed. The significance of these graphs is the following. The nodes are the, if I assume you have some kind of field theoretic discussion, the nodes are related to the field variables. The links are actually the orbits of the field variables under the action of the supercharges. So that's the significance of those lines. I see. Thank you very much. And more questions? Oh, I have also one more question. It's very simple. And you presented very um, at, uh, um, answer. I would like to ask uh, how um, all calculations are performed just by hands or you, <laughs> you, use, some, or you use some code or <laughs> several <laughs> students. How technically you organize all this stuff? Yes. <laughs> so really, that's a great question. It's impossible to do this by hand. Mm -hmm. uh, what you, what we, what we did is, well, well, how do I say? It? We use our hand-driven calculations at low levels and where you can do it and think about what's going on. But mm -hmm. we, the only way that our hands and uh, uh, and eyes came into calculation is to figure out the way to construct the algorithms to do mm -hmm. the actual calculations. So, mm -hmm. uh, for example, those 10 dimensional systems that I, I, I brought I, to your attention, we kind of use that to perfect our thinking in order to be able to, for the 10 dimensional systems, you're only talking about uh, um, tens of thousands of nodes, whereas for the 11 dimensional systems, you're talking about billions of nodes. So the 10 dimensional systems, yeah, we could do some stuff with our hands, and we did, and we use that to figure out things. But once we had understood what the rules of the road were, then the work went into writing algorithms to, to attack the actual problem. Okay. And I have to give great tribute to my students here because like in, uh, last time I actually wrote code was in 1970 and I was using Fortran on punch cards. Okay, thank you. Ah, still we have one more question from Sravan. Sravan, please. Uh, uh, hi. <laughs> well, one yes, more question. Yes, very me. active, yes. Yeah. Actually, the question is a, a bit of extension of Irina's question, the previous question. Uh, you see, at the, towards the end of the talk, you were mentioning when you were explaining these uh, young tableaus, uh, you, were, you mentioned about genomes. I, I'm a bit lost there. I mean, is it some there is application in biology or, or about the supersymmetric Well, you know, that's a very interesting question. I've been at, wondering about that question so I, since I first... I didn't, tell, I didn't explain to you in detail how the graphs fold. It turns out that, so let, let me pull up a slide let me, let me, because it'd be easy if I have a certain okay. slide. So hang on a second. Okay, at one point in my talk, I discussed, uh, discussed this object, the graph that's on the left, and how, in some sense, the graph on the right contains the, uh, the graph on the left. Uh, let me try to go through this again. So, the four nodes that you see indica indicated here under if you ask what are the Lorentz transformation properties of these nodes, they describe a four vector. And that's why they go in here. The node that sits out here, as well as the node on the other side, are singlets. And that's why you have the ones on these multiplicities. So that's item number one. So 
This thing as a four-dimensional superfield where you fully enforce four-dimensional Lorentz symmetry is actually this object. But there, but there's sort of like degrees of freedom hidden inside of here. That's item number one. The other thing that I talked about. Was this process where I claimed that the graph at the top, which is the same as the one I showed you before, actually splits into two pieces. Well, it doesn't actually split, it actually folds the two pieces. And the folding is, control, is controlled by air correction codes. Before I did this work, the only place in natural science I ever heard of air correction codes was genomics. So I've been thinking about connections with biology. I mean, look, the crazy thing is, if supersymmetry is actually ever uh, shown to show up in nature uh, at a fundamental level, then these error correcting codes that I'm talking about here will be part of the description of nature. And then you have to ask the question, how in the world did they get there? The only process I know in nature for getting them there is evolution. And therefore, if supersymmetry shows up, for me, it's the, the biggest question I've ever asked in my career, which I, I have no hopes of answering, is how in the world does evolution act on the mathematical laws of the universe? Because that's what would have to be the case if supersymmetry actually showed up. This is a question much deeper than dark matter. This is the ultimate implication of the research I've done over the last few years. Okay. Thank you very much. This is actually indeed very interesting one because, uh, uh, well, I, I, have, I used to have some debate with my wife always that who is biologist. She ah. says mathematics can never uh, explain biology. It fails. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, I, so. Well, you know, look, I, I, I always have a very tough fight with my wife. I always have a very tough argument with her because I love uh, mathematics. And so, yeah, <laughs> very interesting to know. I can tell her now, well, there is supersymmetry which will answer the question at no, some it's point. Not just, you know, look, uh, there's been progress in protein folding. So. Uh, and so, physics and math are slowly creeping up on biology. So, Maybe not in our lifetime, but I wouldn't be surprised if uh, the physicists continue to uh, find the secrets that sit behind biology. Okay. We already had a lot of questions, so we go to the end. Uh, let's uh, thanks once again. Our speaker, thank you very much for your very interesting talk. Thank you very much. No, thank, you. thank you for the invitation. Thank you. Let me just say that, look, I, I, I re recognize that I could be crazy, folks, <laughs> but uh, the mathematics is incredibly rich uh, in this. And uh, we're hoping to inspire other people because these ideas need to be researched, uh, especially if we're going to make progress in these high dimensional super symmetric I know of no other efficient way to study these questions. So mm -hmm. although I may appear a little bit off the beaten track, uh, we have found tools that uh, I believe have great potential. Okay, I agree. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. 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 Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.